unidentifiable flying object. The UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be anything. A UFO. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of UFO No, the show that continues to separate science fact from science fiction the best that we can. We just look at it with with unbiased, just looking at it for what it seems to be and then kind of breaking it down, throwing in what's going on with technology and what's going on, using some common sense, connecting dots that clearly connect, clearly connect. Anyways, thank you very much. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for tuning in. Go check out the other episodes. They're pretty good. They're not bad. They're not bad. We talk about all kinds of crazy shit. Um, but if you've been following along, thank you so much. Love you. Very, very, very much. Love it. Um, and I want to talk to you. Hit me up. 208-790-8226. Let me know. Let me know you're listening to the show. I'd love to chat with you. Let me know how you heard about it. Let me know what you think about it. And maybe we can have a conversation on the show. I would love to do that. I've got all kinds of nifty ways to be able to get a hold of you and get you on the show. So if you do, let me know. Let's let's uh let's chat about some crazy shit, huh? And I go deep and I like to talk about this stuff, you know. So anyways, and I think, you know, having multiple viewpoints about uh conspiracy and paranormal and you know, extraterrestrial and the whole kit and caboodle. Having a, a a great perspective from a whole bunch of people, I think, is a great way. So I'd love to have a bunch of people come and talk to us. Oh, if you got an idea, if you have some theories, if you want to do all that. Now, speaking, if you've been following along, you know Blind Mike is is uh, has not been on the show in a while, folks. So uh, if you are have been following along, you know he's been he's been abducted, and so we are trying to get him back. All right. So if you have resources, time, whatever you can donate, if you can donate, reach out, get Blind Mike before he's anal to help out any way you can to get Mike back before those bastard aliens get at his ass. All right, please. Thank you. And we it's just a matter of time, folks. We're going to get him back. We're going to get him back. If you want to help the show grow, just share it. Share it with your friends, your family, whoever. You know, if you got people that you uh that you think need to to hear about some things like Project Bluebeam talked about that. I'm going to be talking about that a lot cuz I think there's a lot more going on with that. A lot more going on with that. Um Anyway, share the show. Spotify, we're on there. They've got a way to review now. You can leave stars. Hey, leave us some stars. Love it. We would love it. Thank you. It helps grow the show. You could do that. If you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, wherever, leave a review. And then, of course, uh, share, share, share. And if you really love us and you really want to help grow the show, uh, go go throw $3 at us at patreon.com slash UFO no podcast or UFO no. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh anyways, patreon.com slash UFO no. And uh we got some uh, some Patreon on there. You if you help out, we'll give you some shit. I got some mugs coming. I got merch coming, people. I got merch, so stick with us. We got some big things coming. Anyways, let's get Blind Mike back. Help go support the show. Uh if you're into C B D, go check out Clarkson C B D dot com. Uh that's a place I help manage and uh I love cannabis i love cannabis if you know me i love cannabis you've heard us talk about it i'm sure on the show um and uh so anyways cbd big part of that so if uh if you got questions whatever go clarkson cbd code.com use promo code ufo no all one word save 10 percent site white uh and then of course if you're into cannabis like i am 
and you're looking for a really balanced experience uh, with quality, no chemicals, you want Hell's Candy Cannabis Company. And guess what? If you're a Washington resident, you're in luck because chances are they're in a local retailer next to you. So go check them out. And if they don't have them, use that number, 208-790-8226. Get a hold of me. Let me know. I'll reach out to them. Be like, hey, you need this. You got people that want it. All right. Let's get down to business, y'all. What are we talking about today? What are we talking about today? I meant to kind of tease into this, but, you know, I'm always a mess. <sighs> We're going to talk about UFOs in Russia. Uh, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a lot of them, a lot of these sightings, believe it or not. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, I, well, I, I've got a whole thing that ties in. I mean, if you've heard episodes in the past, you know I talk about Nazis a lot. I believe there's a lot of ties to Russia and the, um, you know, the Pac-5 idea of these five uh, nations coming together, uh, China, Russia, U.S. being some of them. And um, anyways, there's all kinds of things like this. But during the Soviet Union, I believe there was a lot of testing in uh, government crap. But we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about specifically one tale involving UFO being chased by MiG fighter jets that eventually crashed in the Shaitan Mazar, which translates at, as Grave of the Devil in the Tian Shan Mountains in Kyrgyzstan. I know I'm saying it wrong. Near the Chinese border that led several search and retrieval missions. Plus, we're going to look at several other incidents of crashed UFOs in the final years of the Cold War in the Soviet Union. And, uh, and I'm telling you, I am, I'm about ready to take us on a journey here real soon into Project Bluebeam deep dive. Deep dive. Because I believe this is happening, but this is a precursor. We're going to talk about Soviet Union, government craft, of course, government cover-ups. Government, they're shiesty bastards. Let's get into it. Once again, share the episode. Please, thank you. Love you all. Oh, by the way, how was your New Year's? How was your New Year's? Was it good? I hope it was great. I hope your Christmas was great. We got a lot of snow over here in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of snow. It's been icy and slushy and snowy and cold and not good. Anyways, all right, let's go. I hope it was good. Welcome to the new year. New conspiracies to be had. All right. Story goes. At around 5 p.m., on August 28th, 1991, a huge unknown object estimated around 2,000 feet long and around 300 feet wide was spotted over the Caspian Sea at an altitude of 21,000 feet being tracked by radar operators at the tracking station on the Mangishlak Peninsula moving at an approximate speed of over 6,000 miles per hour. That's fucking fast. And after issuing a friend or foe request and receiving no reply, the tracking station notified the Cosmodrome at Kapustan Yar, who confirmed they were also tracking the object and that no other aircraft of theirs or anybody else's from their facility or anyone else's was in the region. Moments later, four more MiG-29 uh, MiG fighter jets that were already airborne on a routine mission were sent to the area to intercept. Their orders were to have the unknown craft land, and if it refused, shoot it down. A short time later, over the Aral Sea, they had radar and visual confirmation of the craft, describing it as being long and strong and about to get its friction on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was long. Uh, and metallic gray. The leader of the MiG fighter jets issued another friend or foe request, ordering it to the ground. Once again, no response. Flying around 2,500 feet from the object, the MiGs closed in. As they got closer, they could see more detail. And according to the pilots, they saw, and I quote, green colored writing or symbols on the exterior of the unknown uh, of the craft, an unknown language and two portholes on what they assumed was the front of the object. 
The flight leader radioed to the ground control for further instruction because, once again, they were ordered to uh, shoot at them if they couldn't get him to land. They were ordered to close in on the craft a little tighter. Once they were parallel to the vehicle, they were ordered to fire warning shots in front of it. The MiGs closed in on the object from 2,500 feet to around 1,500 feet, two on each side. But when they went to fire the warning shots, all of the electrical systems suddenly went down, causing the plane engines to fail, and the object took off into the distance. And as soon as the craft disappeared, the plane's controls and engines immediately came back on. Radio operators continued to track the object, and it appeared to be heading back to the Aral Sea, moving at an unbelievable 42,000 miles per hour. So they warned other military and civilian airfields in the apparent flight path of the object uh, that uh, they could have incoming. After 45 minutes, it vanished from radar screens and, of course, uh, visual. Over the following weeks... The military was having discussions, debriefings, and it came out that according to the locals, rumors were getting around on the day of the incident that they saw this. Several locals saw a huge object crash into the Shaitan Mazar mountain region. Now, by the end of September, they set up an expedition team made up of UFO researchers from the UFO organization Sakufan, led by Anton Bogotov. I'm, I know I'm saying Bogotov. Boga, it's Bog, it starts with a B, ends with a V. Several locals who knew the area well and several experienced mountain climbers were sent to locate the craft. After two weeks... They found nothing, no crash site, no wreckage, but rumors reached the team that several local residents had found the site and appeared to have suffered burns, as well as their watches all stopped at the exact same time. Crazy. Think about, uh, have you seen that movie, The War? I mean, it's a known thing, War of the Worlds, uh, the original Shows the watches all stop. I think it's even in the remake versions. They've got, uh, there's this channel called Epics. They've got a War of the Worlds. Fantastic story. Fantastic story. If you're not familiar with the original, how that came to be, I believe it was the 1930s. Uh, Orson Welles. Yeah, Orson Welles. Uh, was on the radio and did a War of the Worlds telling on the on radio, like a radio play of War of the Worlds. And it scared the holy shit out of the general population. I mean, it was, I, I think they said like one and a half million people believed this actually happened. There was people that were running out of their homes, people that crashed their cars. You got to think radio back then was everywhere. That's what everybody had. That's what they had in their home. That's what they had. I believe in their cars. I believe they had radio in cars then. I'm I'm sure of it. So with that being said, everyone listened to the radio. So nowadays the idea of 1.6 million people listening to local radio is kind of, kind of, you think, well, what about all the internet things? Still check out local radio. It's rad. I used to work in it. So I got a bias, but, uh, Anyways, that's where you're going to hear a lot of the local stuff going on. You know, obviously, most news they want to, you know. Anyways, I am way getting off on a tangent. Anyways, the reason I say that about uh, War of the Worlds is that was something that happened due to magnetic um, disturbances caused by the craft. So, in that way, this is thought to be the same reason why their watches stopped working as well. So, anyways... That was a long description, and I apologize. Anyways, all right. So after two weeks, they found no no wreckage, no crash, no nothing. So the expedition team headed to the Sarai Dezaz River Valley to visit the location of the apparent crash. 
But after another two weeks in this crazy mountain environment of the Russian mountains, and after several members of the team got frostbite, they decided to head back to camp. But even after getting back, the rumors and local gossip continued about the crash UFO. So despite having failed miserably the first time, uh, Russian authorities go ahead and launch another one with the uh, Russian Air Force claiming they located the wreckage in November of 91. Uh, However, as the unit attempted to lift a piece of the wreckage, it caused the helicopter to crash and killing everybody on board. So now you've got a crashed helicopter nearby an apparent crashed UFO. But Russians don't give up. So on the third attempt in the late spring, they decided to let it warm up a bit, or early summer of 92, this time led by retired Russian major German Svekov with three separate units and Sakufan, they discovered what appeared to be the crash site along with the crashed helicopter in the Grave of the Devil region. Now, the object they found had broken in half, basically, or in two parts um, on this cliff that overhung. uh, It was kind of like there was like this cliff that overhung the area, and then this... Uh, it looked like the craft had hit the cliff, broke in half, and then, and then like slumped into the area. So, many of the expedition team claimed there was some kind of strange energy coming from the object, an energy that was almost palpable, they said, even from 5,000 feet away theorizing that it was the strong electromagnetic fields that caused the, that it was strong electromagnetic fields that was causing this uh, energy that could have stopped the watches of the locals that had the burns. And then as well as affected the helicopter's equipment to cause a malfunction and the crash. But as they got closer, they started to get really nervous and really scared because all of their own electronic devices and equipment started to malfunction. And that made it basically impossible to do any of the experiments they were going to do. And when they checked their compasses, all the needles were pointed directly to the craft. So as this expedition team looked around the crash site, they were able to work out a likely scenario that the object, once again, like I said, had crashed into the cliff, uh, the cliff that overhang, overhung above them, and it crashed and broke in two, coming down to the ground, skidding around 5,000 feet before coming to a stop. The team found two gaping holes in the sides of the object giving access to the inside, and inside of it, they saw strange beams and the flooring of the craft. And there was also a ton of damage to the front of the vehicle where it apparently had hit the ground. So they also found the same green-colored writing and symbols reported by the MiG fighter pilots in August when they encountered the object, or what they assume is the same object, um, over the Caspian Sea. And after being studied... Uh, They sent, well, they sent, so what they did is they took traces of the writing, sent that off to be studied, and after studying it clearly after this event, um, they matched it with no known language. Now, the team claimed that they captured the downed craft on film and photograph, but that this magnetic or electromagnetic energy or whatever it was, this energy field ruined the films, making it all come out severely dark and blurry. Uh, blurry. Uh, six years later, August 1998, without the 
German, uh, what was he? Uh, uh, what was he Russian? Uh, I want to take just a moment to talk about CBD. CBD works as a very powerful anti-inflammatory. And I'm sure a lot of you have met someone who's used it or know a family member who's using CBD to relieve pain, anxiety. And the truth is, it does all of those things. Helps relieve pain, reduce and prevent inflammation, as well as relieving anxiety and stress on top of improving quality of life. So if you're looking to try CBD for the first time or get into something new and you want some answers, Clarkston CBD Company is where you want to go. Little plates I help manage, uh, as well as educate people as to the benefits and products that can work for them. Check us out online, ClarkstonCBDCo.com. Shop online, reach out on Facebook, Clarkston CBD Company, and back to the show. Uh, oh, shit. Oh, he's a major. Uh, without the German major, uh, Svekoff, who led the second mission that was successful and significantly less resources were given to him, this team six years later managed to find the site again. Uh, but this time, all that they found were the markers that they had left marking the perimeter of the area. The wreckage, the craft, the helicopter was all gone. All of it. All right, so now let's look at some details, some sticky points, if you will. All right. No pictures or video. Just testimony of some strange energy destroying all the footage makes it pretty easy to... Uh, dismiss the entire thing. Why didn't they send a plane to go over and take a photograph for an, a photograph mission? Or even send another unit further away from the footage to get, or, or from the wreckage to get footage? Because they clearly, when they got closer, it was... The energy. So why not stay at 5,000 feet and get footage? They didn't do any of that. But if it's true that this happened, did the military remove the wreckage? Why didn't this German major go, since he was successful in the second one and found it, why didn't he want to lead the last one to go and actually like collect more data? And it could have have been that because he was military, he knew it was already gone. So maybe that's why he didn't go. Anyways, that one's a good uh, who done it, who stole the UFO wreckage. Now look, I'm skeptical on anything that doesn't have evidence. Anything that doesn't have, do I mean, look, we're talking about. I believe this, yeah, 91, 92, you know, the, you were dealing with camcorders and Polaroids and you didn't have really sophisticated photo, uh, photography equipment like you do now. You don't have the, uh, the digital type of, you know, um, you just don't have digital access like you do now. There's so much you can do now with imagery and, and that's part of the problem. Here's part of the problem is even when you get documented footage, like footage, film, video, uh, photographs, how do you know it wasn't replicated? Now, people can go in and there's there's specialists apparently that can go in and be like, oh, it was Photoshop for sure. And, uh, but I don't know, man. It is getting so the average individual, and I can tell you, I do a certain amount of graphic design myself. I can tell you that the amount of things that I, and I'm dumb as fuck, that I can do is incredible. It blows my mind. So when you have somebody who actually knows what the fuck they're doing and how to do it and how to manipulate it, and then also they're trying to make it look as real as possible to pass it off as authentic, man, you're going to have a hard time. Think about think about an individual that can counterfeit money and how easy that passes on. Huh? Now think about 
the the amount of digital software available to the average consumer and then take someone whose intentions are to fake shit. I'm telling you, I think it would be so hard. So even if there is documented evidence, video footage, photographs, whatever it is, these days it's hard to know if it's faked or not. So what do you go off of? So that's where the whole argument of, oh, well, we go off of uh, people that have good reputations, you know, astronauts, pilots, uh, you know, government officials, whistleblowers, all this stuff. Well, how, with disinformation campaigns that come through that we know about, we know exist, how do you then filter out what's true and what's not? Ah, see, this is the dilemma of conspiracy theories as a whole. When you look at these stories is how do you know what's real and what's not? So you ha- you kind of look at the evidence, but then there's just, it's, it's so it's, it's a lot based on belief. It's all, well, I believe aliens exist, right? That's why it's very difficult to not get involved with a bias because you tend to overlook certain data that you don't because it doesn't confirm what you want to believe. And it's hard to change your belief system you know anyways another tangent but i really do believe that all these things are connected and the hardest part is you have people that are taking advantage of that that know that and they take advantage. They send disinformation agents out and we're going to get more into this type of stuff. I'm telling you, I'm going to go, I've been balls deep in project blue beam, trying to research more and more and more, trying to get a good handle on something that I can bring to you all. That's really laid out. Like this is what they're doing. This is how they're doing it. And, uh, so anyways, but, um, anyways, that is a good, scenario involving government cumber up potentially but there's so, such a lack of evidence it's so hard to know so anyways that's just a good who done it but on this theme of strange energies and strange symbols let's look at a ufo crash near nizni chigam nizni chagam i believe story goes Around 11 a.m. on the morning in question, an anomalous object was spotted by Soviet military radar operators near the city of Proladnia. Proladny, clearly Russian is not a good language for me, with all attempts to communicate with no response. Several MiG fighters were scrambled to intercept the object with surface-to-air missiles on standby. Now, here's where the story gets a little bit vague because somehow, and no one points fingers in any of the reports, nobody blames anybody, but somehow one of these missiles on standby was launched and it hit the object, causing it to crash somewhere in the Caucasian mountains. That's white, white mountains. White European mountains, Caucasian An M-18 helicopter immediately carried a retrieval team to the location where the craft was shot down. They would soon locate the remains of what appeared to be a disc-shaped craft around 20 feet wide and around 10 feet high that crashed and skid for a considerable distance before coming to a stop near some large rocks just outside Nizhny Chegum. There's a look, there's a Z in there right next to an H. Right next to an H. So tell me, is it is it Niz Nizhidni or is it Nizni? Chegum. And Chegum is Chegum. You know. Anyways, they landed nearby and quickly secured the area, putting it off limits to anyone without official military clearance. As they did, though, extremely high levels of radiation were detected. The object was then transported to Mozdok Air Base, where a team studied the craft in more detail. The interior of the craft itself had multiple control panels with numerous other pieces of equipment strewn about the wrecked cockpit. 
They also discovered three alien entities around three feet tall with whitish gray skin, although it appeared this skin was actually an outer cover, like futuristic clothing with extremely large black round eyes and large hairless heads, as well as three webbed fingers. Two were dead on the scene, and a third wounded alien died a short time later. You know, that's been a a big uh, theory, is that what we see in these um, small gray aliens are actually like, you know, potentially animatronics or that they're simply wearing some kind of a suit. Um, there's even, a, well, it go, this one goes on to say, when they examined underneath this outer cover, they discovered a blue-green skin with a reptilian texture to it. So potentially hinting at the idea that the small grays might also be reptilian, which would kind of actually go against the concept. There's another theory about how the reptilians race kind of rules over the small gray aliens. There's even, you know, like there's the theory of the draconian race, which would be reptilian, that came down and seeded the earth, being us, and left their underlings, other reptilian beings underground. That's where the idea of underground bases and underground, uh, which I'm not saying isn't true. I'm just saying this is where these theories come from. Uh, but that they left this subterranean reptilian, un- like sub race here to monitor the human race and that the alien grays are like their underlings even. Uh, so, you know, anyways, but who knows? I mean, it could be a matter of cloning. I mean, Jesus, who knows? I mean, look, we're we're speculating as to the even existence of these things, let alone the clothes they wear or the skin they have. So, you know, you go on and on and on about that one. So while these investigations took place, according to the story, a cover up was put into action by the KGB. I, just, I don't believe it at all. The KGB would never do that. Never. Oh, boy. All right, here's another one. A UFO crash near Vladivostok. Story goes, Soviet Navy personnel witnessed a glowing object enter the waters off the coast of Dalny Vostok region. Unsure whether the object landed or crashed, a retrieval mission was put into action and quickly located an egg-shaped, dull, matte-gray-colored object with a gradual dome on the top, approximately 20 feet long, with six oval portholes around the lower part that weren't transparent, and no one could see inside. They found it resting on the seabed. They could see light damage to the underside of the craft with a crack being clearly visible. The team was unable to gain access into the object, so it was secretly transported to Moscow to train or by train to the Central Material Research Institute for more in-depth testing. However, the team struggled to break into the object, but were able to have more success with the large object on the underside, finding that the outer exterior itself appeared to be made of four separate layers. So after three weeks, they created a gap allowing scientists inside. You know, this whole thing about, you know, they transported it secretly. They found it. They transported it secretly. This is, uh, you know, the the idea that the military or government, any of them, aren't doing that. Transporting things without your knowledge you know, discovering things without your knowledge, testing things without your knowledge, um, on you potentially without your knowledge. You know, it's it's cracks me up when people are like, the government, the government wouldn't do that. 
I mean, sure, they're, you know, they, they uh, you know, misappropriate money and they're terrible with foreign policy and they're blah, 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 blah. But they would never do. They would. They have. They do. It's numerous, numerous of these supposed conspiracy theories have come true, have been declassified. I love the show Hunting Hitler. If you've never seen it on the History Channel, and now you can find it fucking random places, but I love that show because they basically prove that Hitler did not die in the bunker, did not commit suicide, but actually escaped through the help of various governments, including Argentina, potentially Cuba, to get him out of Germany and into Argentina and protected. I mean, they've got they've got witnesses that claim to put him all the way all the way into the seventies. Not only that, they found absolute positively German colonies that still uh, are Nazi sympathizers in Buenos Aires and Chile. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I believe a lot of things stem from the Nazis because the Nazis were heavily involved in the occult. Heavily and heavily involved in experimental technology and heavily involved in experiments with humans and who knows what the fuck. That's just what we know about. And then you've got Operation Paperclip that where we acquire 1,600 of them. The, the whole thing. So government sneaking around, sneaking shit, that's not anything new, and it I believe it absolutely happens. This is just one case. One case. Anyways, back to the story. So after the scientists get inside, they find that the vehicle is separated into three separate levels. The engine is on the bottom level. The main control room is on the second level. And the top level acts as some kind of docking room. The main power reactor in the engine room looked as though it exploded and was the possible cause of the crash. In the control room, they found several alien bodies still sitting in their chairs while another one laid on the floor. They were four feet tall with large hairless heads and large round eyes that appeared to be covered by large black lenses. Their skin was a gray-brown color with six fingers on each hand. Mind you, the other ones had three webbed fingers with six fingers on each hand and dressed in a tight-fitting metallic silver suit and silver green boots. Ooh, that sounds classy. Tight-fitting metallic silver suit with silver green boots. I want one. The alien bodies were transported to a secret underground facility just outside, holy shit, here's a word, Solnek, <laughs> Solnek-Nakorsk. My God. There's so many consonants. There's so many. Anyways, Solnek-Nagorsk, with only four officers having knowledge, the craft itself was taken to a mountain base on Novaya, Zemla Island. Jesus, it's a workout for my brain. Secretly transported craft that they're expending, experimenting on that has aliens with killer boots. Damn. Several weeks before this, February 1989, near the Kopansky Lake in the Leningrad region, three men, Yuri Vasilyevich, Sergei Yurovic, and Alexander Viktorovic. My God, they all end in Vic. 
were fishing uh, at Kopansky Lake around 25 miles outside of the town, Sosnovoy, Sosnovi. Viktorovich noticed a strange object overhead at least three to four times larger than the stars that were already visible in the sky. Now, I take issue with this description because what the fuck does that even mean? The object is three to four times larger than the stars that were already visible in the sky. Stars are tiny as shit. I don't understand what that means. So it was three to four times larger than tiny? Stars are little points of light in the sky. I don't understand what anyways... Apparently three to four times larger, so a little bit bigger than a dot in the sky. Alerting his two friends, thinking was headed in their direction. If you're a podcast junkie like me, you've probably thought about starting your own. Well, I can tell you firsthand that starting my podcast has been one of the most fun decisions I've ever made. But it can feel overwhelming if you don't know how to get started. That's where Buzzsprout comes in. Buzzsprout is the easiest and best way to start a professional podcast. In fact, it's so good they've already helped over 100,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout will get your podcast into every major podcasting platform like Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. You also get a great-looking podcasting website, audio players so you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and the list goes on and on. Plus, Buzzsprout publishes new blog posts, podcast episodes, and YouTube videos every week so you can learn the ins and outs of podcasting from the people that eat, drink, and breathe it. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know we sent you, and it helps support our show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. They got He got their attention, but then it made a sudden turn and continued on its way. The men watched it for about 15 minutes before they eventually settled down and uh, went to camp and made dinner. After they'd eaten, Savelivik went into the nearby trees. I, he said he was searching for wood. I think he was taking a shit. I was searching for wood. I was not taking a poop went into the nearby trees to take a shit, not to collect firewood. They would have already had a fire. They they ate food. Come on. Come on. He was taking a shit. Anyways, he walked around 30 feet into the woodland along the shore when he saw around 100 feet in front of him a flat disc-shaped object made from some kind of dark material. These guys are so vague. It was beautifully round with windows around its middle, out of which emanated a soft matte light. You know, here's my problem. When somebody starts using the term soft matte light to describe the lights that came from an object, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily approve. I just think it's too much. You know, like, here's the, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? When there's people that are telling you a story and you you know it's not true because they're throwing so many details. And maybe people are that detail-oriented. Maybe I'm just dumb. I But I don't believe it for a minute. Well, the, the windows emanated a soft, matte light as opposed to a not-soft Matt Light. Uh, fuckery. He slowly approached to get a better look. And he noticed how it appeared to be completely smooth with no seams, joints, hatches, or doors anywhere. He studied the object for around 20 seconds when he noticed a figure of some kind moving to the left of the object. A moment later, he noticed a second figure on the other side and then a third. Now, that's what they call the kill box. Now, in the, in the, in the, in 
the way of aliens, you got two in the front, they grab the arms, third bends you over, anal probe, I'm telling you. Poor blind Mike. Anyways. Feeling nervous and unsure, he backed off slightly into the trees towards the camp, moving slowly and staying quiet until they were around 30 feet from him, at which point he spoke loudly to them, saying, We're friendly! And he was making gestures with his arms, which I assume would be just wavy, because what kind of gestures do you make with your arms and your hands to say you're friendly? Almost everything I mean, look, if if I'm looking at somebody and I don't know what their intentions are, any quick movement with their arms, I'm going to be suspicious of. So what kind of hand and arm gestures do you use to say you're friendly? You know, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm friendly. You just put your arms out like you want to hug? I don't know. Anyways. Said they were friendly, made his arm gestures, hoping to indicate not to attack them. The figures remained silent, but continued to approach him. He later described them as looking similar to humans, but with no hair on their heads and a tightly closed mouth with no lips, a look on their faces of severe concentration. (laughs) Severe concentration. Each also wore a tight-fitting gray suit. Mm, The style. Then a flash, like a camera, appeared, and Vasilievich felt a sudden pressure in his head, and he heard a metallic voice coming from inside his head. What are you doing here? To which he answered as best he could that he was on a fishing trip. He claims the voice asked if he wanted to go with them, adding, you will not return. We need to know what your inner structure is. Jesus, that to me sounds like they're going to experiment on you. (laughs) We want to know what your inner structure is. Yeah, I bet you do. He told them no (laughs) and began to back away more. The voice returned to his head, this time the tone threatening, telling him that if humans started a nuclear war, we will destroy you. Here's where I'm always skeptical. I'm always skeptical that these are tree-hugging hippies, which I have nothing against. I love trees, and I love hippies. I'm just saying that these are typically the type of people that are saying no to nuclear, right? So when coming up with a scheme of solidifying this, this tale that they tell, potentially coming away with a message for humanity that most, a lot of people tend to kind of be on the same page. Hey, we all need to be nicer to each other. You know, of course, you know, like you have the movies, of course. Like, think about that movie, The Abyss. Great movie. If you've never seen it, great movie. Uh, You got to go see it. Anyways, lady gets in touch with aliens. The aliens basically tell her, hey, you all got to be nicer to each other, and we're going to send a big wave to show you that we mean business. Anyway, so... We got to be nice to each other. So a lot of these tales come away with, you know, hey, don't hurt each other. Hey, don't go nuclear. Hey, don't do this, which I just, I I don't know. I'm skeptical of that. I'm skeptical of that. Because, like, how is an alien species that is clearly far more advanced, clearly just going to know how to relate to you in your language. Like, we don't know. I don't know how to comprehend any other language other than what I know. How would they know what I know? That's what I'm asking, I suppose. I just think it would, you know, like you talk to people that have a psychedelic experience, like with DMT specifically, okay? People come away talking about how they they met entities, which they, they a lot of people will say they're gods or they're aliens, whatever. But it's difficult to understand what they're trying to say. It's it's hard to communicate clear messages. And it's more like it's more like visual based feelings kind of that, that, that you get versus, you know, don't go nuclear. 
we will destroy you, you know, things like that. Like, so I don't know. I just, I'm skeptical of all this. I keep ranting, but I, that's, I just, that's what makes me skeptical of stories like that. Then Vasilovich heard a loud buzzing sound like a high voltage wire. And he saw another humanoid figure appear with shaggy hair on its body and a head similar to an ape, Bigfoot. At least 10 feet tall, perhaps taller. Bigfoot. Maybe. I had somebody tell me this. Uh, I'm trying to remember who told me this. The Bigfoot potentially, you know, that uh, back in our Neanderthal times, potentially we were bigger and covered in hair. And that maybe that's what we're seeing. I also think, what if we're, what if it's big people covered in furs and we just don't know that it's furs? We think it's just fur, not like a collection of furs to make a clothing. Who knows? Anyways, shaggy hair, 10 feet tall, Bigfoot. Now, the high voltage wire sound. Was that a transporter? I think it's transporter. It suddenly appeared. It was hairy. I don't know. But high voltage wire sound, like a zap, some kind of thing like that. That could easily be. Easily be. All right, 1989, Kapustin Yar nuclear test site. Story goes, communications officer V. Voloshin was on duty and spotted an object hovering over missile units in the base weapons depot. He climbed up the watchtower 18 feet above the ground so he could clearly see a glaring blinking signal, which was a as bright as a camera flash, approximately 15 feet across with a semi-spherical dome on the top of the vehicle. So he climbed all the way to the 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 watchtower the or the the water tower no it was a watchtower to get a clearer view of this thing so it appeared several circular movements or it performed several circular movements around 200 feet almost as if scanning the buildings below then headed out toward the rail track where it uh the railroad track where it remained for a short time before heading back in the direction of the missile units he watched the object for around two hours before it headed toward the town of Aktubinsk. Another officer, G. Kulik, noted that he witnessed a fireball which rose from the earth and headed in the direction of the strange craft. Uh, then the strange vehicle approached him and he could physically feel its approach. Well, that, that got confusing. So, basically, <laughs> the other... Oh, I see. So, it was several several of these orbs came up and actually joined up with this other craft. And this guy, G. Kulik, could actually feel this vehicle approach. That's, that's weird. Uh... Just over a week earlier, at around 2.40 a.m. on the 20th of July, 1989, in Sochi region of Caucasus, according to an article in the Kirort Nia Gazeta, a strange object and two humanoid creatures were reported. The witness, Tatiana Vasilivyanya Galafeshko, with her husband, Vladimir, and their daughter, Anuta, were vacationing on the coast of the Black Sea. Tatiana laid awake in the bed with all the windows open due to the heat when she heard footsteps outside. She turned and looked toward the window, and she saw two humanoid creatures, each with green-gray skin three to four feet high. They walked through the wall, and in a blink of an eye stood by the bed looking down at her. But she didn't feel fear at first. She was just curious, noticing how large and deep black their eyes were with no eyebrows or no eyelashes, and their skin was extremely pale and bloodless. 
And for some reason that she doesn't know, she felt that they were old. And then suddenly she realized she couldn't move or speak. And that's when fear shot through her. And then after hearing a strange muffled sound, two beings vanished, or the two beings vanished. And just when she thought it was over, a strange tennis ball-sized object flew into the room like ball lightning. So if you're not familiar with ball lightning, it's this weather phenomena that uh, all kinds of government agencies love to blame shit on. But ball lightning, which I don't know if it was this. Ball lightning is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's an electrical charged collection of lightning, it seems, that's moving throughout the atmosphere, and it takes the shape of a ball. Now, they've shown that most of the time these are very high up in the atmosphere. They generally don't come down very low. So, you know, and then there's the whole theory of orbs and all that. Either way, this thing that she saw was like ball lightning, but it was controlled and it moved into another room of the apartment before disappearing out of the window. As soon as it disappeared, she jumped out of her bed, rushed to shut all the windows, and she heard another strange sound, so she rushed to close the door to the other room before she returned to her bedroom. And coincidence or not, the next day, the family TV no longer worked, and every clock and watch in the house had stopped at 2.55 a.m. An electrical charge, that whole electromagnetic from the first uh, story, that could have been potentially what that was from. I mean, who knows? There's all kinds of things. But if it was a lot of electricity, that would clearly do it. According to a Russian investigator, Nikolai Sabatin, a battle of sorts took place over the city of Zayostrovka in September of 1989 with multiple witnesses describing a large golden saucer in the sky followed shortly by six smaller silver disc-shaped cra crafts which appeared to attack it with a strange beam of light. Clearly, this is another tale. I was a terrible segue, and I apologize. But this is another tale of a battle in the sky. So all the objects perform maneuvers that were completely beyond the capability of any known craft uh, that they knew of, some of them coming down as low as 5,000 feet. Now, we know from, uh, I believe it's David Fravor, who saw the Tic Tac uh, craft that the Pentagon admitted was real, um, went on Joe Rogan and talked about it. Went, I'm sure he's been numerous places, but the two biggest ones were Joe Rogan and the Lex Friedman podcasts that he was on that way. Really talks about it, breaks it down. Excellent interviews on those. And he talks about very similar um, maneuvers being done where they were going from 60,000 feet to approximately one foot above the ocean within a matter of less than a minute, less than a second. I can't remember what it was. It was incredibly fast, incredibly fast. And the way he describes it is that there's no possible way without some kind of anti-gravitational uh, technology would this craft be able to do that. Uh, so similar maneuvers being uh, being performed here the semi palatinsk newspaper claimed that during the incident a local power grid went down blacking out the entire city and in the newspaper article witnesses claimed that the golden disc was eventually overpowered by the six smaller crafts and appeared to land disappearing from view behind a large house and crash into the ground. According to Sabatin's research, the craft crashed by a military test range that was not open to the general public. And it appeared that a retrieval mission was launched by the military and the craft was recovered. According to another Russian UFO investigator, Emil Bakurin, military medical records suggested that several 
of the personnel suffered various injuries during the recovery mission. Not disclosed exactly what type of injuries. By the time that the UFO investigators were allowed access, all signs of any crash had been removed. Apparently, around this time, an airplane attempted to fly over the area to capture pictures, but as it approached, all of its navigational equipment malfunctioned. The test range was officially shut down, and uh, but remained still under strict military guard. Now, you know, once again, there, with that one, when you have a... So, you have several smaller crafts apparently attacking another one which look we we have no idea it's a beam which looks like it's attacking another thing and then the thing crashes maybe it was something where they were trying to power it up instead and it didn't work who knows but either way it crashes it's covered up um you know it's it's a tale as old as time of governments covering up these types of things. Um, but the electromagnetic, you know, once again, this, this to me, this makes it all seem domestic. It doesn't make it. Electromagnetic technology is not advanced, at least not by our standards, and certainly I would think not by an advanced being's standards. So why would they use electromagnetic anything? But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, several years, uh, here's another one for you. Several years after the breakup of the Soviet Union, February 1997, over St. Petersburg, at around 7 p.m., multiple residents, including air traffic staff and pilots, witnessed a cluster of lights hovering, hovering overhead. Radar operators at the local airport spotted strange aerial anomalies on radar screens. Then, visually, one witness, Victor Lakstushin, It's amazing that we live in a time that you can go and shop for cannabis like you do shoes. All kinds of different types and sizes for all types of different individuals. Well, if you're like me and you like a nice balanced experience with no pesticides, clean, soil-grown craft cannabis, then you want to ask for Hell's Canning Cannabis Company in your local Washington retailer. The reason why is because they use true live organic soil recipes, custom-made per strain, per plant, like Mother Nature intended. You can't get any better. So, if you want craft cannabis with a balanced experience, ranging from strains like Jesus OG or Acapulco Gold or their own Hell's Cookies, then you want Hell's Canyon Cannabis Company. Ask for them in your local Washington retailer, and if they don't have it, tell them to talk to me, and I'll make sure they get it. Back to the show. God, these names, I'm so jealous. Watched for several minutes, recalling how the lights would reappear, or appear, then disappear, and reappear, forming into a triangular formation for around 20 minutes before finally disappearing altogether. Now, think about the Phoenix Lights incident. Are you familiar with that one? Familiar, uh, Phoenix Lights was, I believe, 1,500 people witnessed this big V formation of lights hover silently over, uh, man, it went a long ways. It went over Phoenix. It was, it was a very long time. Anyways, a lot of people saw it. It was reported on the news. The governor even did this fake little thing. Oh, we caught the, the perpetrator, and there was some guy in a mask in a costume. They pulled off, and they told everybody to lighten up. These are only a few of the incidents that took place over the Soviet Union. They're all similar. They're crashed vehicles for whatever reason that were not able to be investigated or researched by the general public. 
scooped up by governments, various governments, well, in this case, Russia, and tested and, and whatever they did with it, whatever they did with it. Here's where I feel the disconnect is with all this. The automatic response is to say it's extraterrestrial because we don't know what it is because it looks alien. There are so many things in our world now that even in the 80s, the 70s, the 90s, they could not imagine. Think about Star Trek. They could not imagine the internet. They couldn't imagine the internet the way it is. They, they, there were still things that advances in technology we have made in the real world that science fiction could not predict. So we're beyond that point of, of older science fiction. We're beyond that now. We're moving into f- much further. Here's where I'm getting at. Some say that these are secret military vehicles. The counter argument to that being, why would they test military vehicles over heavily populated areas? Like in the case of Phoenix Lights or the one, the, uh, the one in St. Petersburg. Why test? Why allow people to see this? You know, they're like, oh, no. They're not going to let that secret go, so it must be alien. Nobody looks at a UFO or a UAV, whatever you want to call them, and says, look, government cover-up. Nobody. It's the perfect cop-out. It's the perfect fall guy. Oh, it's aliens. Oh, it's UFOs. Oh, it's it's uh, it's an uh, unknown flying object. An Unknown aerial vehicle. Real easy to test openly your own technology, be it holographic, simulated, drone, piloted, experimental, whatever. When you have the general population that's immediately going to blame aliens. Or at least say, oh, fuck, I have no idea what that was. These specific stories, these cases, might not be government. These might be alien, extraterrestrial. But what's, in my opinion, the easiest and simplest answer instead of extraterrestrial beings, interdimensional beings, whatever, traveling around, making contact with us, watching over us, which absolutely could be, absolutely could be. Or a government that is known to manipulate its people, a government that is known to take an experiment with technology, known It's known that we, the military, has technology far beyond what we, the common folk, have. The general public. It's known. It's also known that there are, once again, like I said in the beginning, there are numerous quote-unquote conspiracy theories that have been declassified and been shown to actually have taken place. Real government money, that's your money. Maybe not you right now, depending on how young you were, but certainly your parents, your grandparents, somebody's money. Not theirs. So this government that does this then tests their 
equipment, technology, whatever you want to call it, out in the open because they know that they have this cover that they can fall back on. And all they got to do is probe it every once in a while. All they did, think about this, all the Pentagon did was admit that three videos were real. They didn't have to give up any secrets. They didn't have to declassify anything. They didn't have to apologize for covering up anything or admit that they covered up anything by simply admitting that these videos are real and that we don't know what they are. Yes, otherworldly vehicles exist, but we don't know what they are. And what do you have? You have the general public that goes, oh, look, they admitted they're real. Well, what's the next stage of that? They're going to start releasing in incrementally technology. And more and more of these things going, look what's real. Look what exists. Look what's out there. Because they need us to move to the next phase. Because they got some serious shit that would blow our minds that if they even gave us a peek at without these small steps forward. Tale as old as time. They're doing it. They're going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring you guys uh, the whole project blue beam breakdown. I'm going to bring it to you. We're going to do this. It's going to be great. I'm very excited, but I'm, I'm getting my poop in a group. As far as the whole like video thing, I know I've been teasing that, saying I'm, I'm going to get some video podcasts going, and I am. I'm having technical difficulties. I just want it to be perfect. Uh, so I'm working on all that shit. Once again, guys, let's get Blind Mike. Let's get him back. Let's get him back. Get Blind Mike before he's anal probed.com. Help out any way you can. And please, share the episode. really helps out a lot. Share with your friends, family. Whoever cares, share, share, share. Please, please, please. As well, you can go to patreon.com slash UFO podcast and help out there. Uh, and reach out, 208-790-8226. Reach out to me. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know what you think of the show. And uh, I'd love to have you on, whoever you are, whoever you are, whoever you are. I'd love to have you on. Reach out. Let's do this. Like I said, I got a ton of ways to be able to get you on. Anyways, I love you all. Hey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hope you all have a great one. Welcome to 2022. It's going to be a new year with all kinds of new crazy things. Watch out, y'all. The government, they're shysty bastards.